Shopify grows your business no matter how far or big you grow. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. Whether you're selling your fans' next favorite shirt or an exclusive piece of podcast merch, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. Allbirds, Rothy's, Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. Because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash income, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash income now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. If there's one book that turned the running world on its head and inspired millions to pick up the sport, it has to be Born to Run. Christopher McDougall's firsthand tale of drama and barefoot running included an unforgettable cast of characters like Caballo Blanco and Barefoot Ted set in a backdrop of mystery and danger in the Copper Canyon of Mexico. Runners everywhere set aside traditional running shoes to run free, like the sandal-wearing Tarahumara natives Chris chronicled. The book was incredibly impactful, and many runners, even a decade later, credit Born to Run with their running origin story, myself included. But the advice in the book isn't without controversy. Barefoot and minimalist running exploded in popularity in the early years after it was published, but it's faded in appeal as many runners got hurt and moved back into traditional running shoes. High-tech shoes with space-age foam and carbon plates are on the feet of every elite runner and most of the pack behind them. But that doesn't mean that barefoot and minimalist running doesn't have its place, even with elite athletes. Christopher McDougall and his coach, Eric Orton, are back to explain how. Welcome to The Planted Runner. I'm Coach Claire Bartholik, and my mission is to help you improve your running, your mindset, and your life with science-backed training and plant-based nutrition. In this episode, Chris and Eric teach some of the lessons in their new training book, Born to Run 2. You'll learn how training your feet is critical to running pain-free, why fueling your runs with a traditional high-carbohydrate diet might not be the best advice for health and longevity, and the controversial chapter in the new book that they almost didn't add. Chris's internet connection was a little shaky at times, so hopefully this audio comes through okay because this was a delightful conversation. And don't forget to stay tuned all the way to the end of the episode for another Mental Strength Minute. Fortify your mind in 60 seconds or less. And now here's my conversation with Christopher McDougall and Eric Orton. Welcome to The Planted Runner, Eric and Chris. How are you? Hey, Claire. Thanks for having us. Super happy, Claire. How are you doing? Good to have you. I'm doing great. It's an honor to have you on the show. Uh, you're definitely an inspiration. I'll tell you a little bit about that later. But first of all, Chris, your book, Born to Run, absolutely transformed the running community about a decade ago. I would love to know what has been the most meaningful part of that whole journey. You know, I think it's really been personal. Um, you know, a lot of people will reflect or share with me like their own inspirational stories, how Born to Run uh, inspired them to go out and do things they didn't think they were capable of doing. But I have to say, kind of egotistically for me, the real benefit has been that this dream that Eric Gordon you know, shared with me years ago, this idea that a big, overweight, busted down, medically deficient guy could actually find running 
to be joyful and easy and injury free. And I was a big old doubter for years. To me, the big benefit was it actually is true. 15 years later, exactly what he told me back in 2005 has turned out to be true. Amazing. So Eric, how did you and Chris first meet? Yeah, we first met in Denver, Colorado back in 2005. He uh, was commissioned to do a men's journal magazine article on my training and coaching. And we had to meet in Denver because it was winter in Jackson Hole and it was for a summer issue. So we had to go find some place that had mountains that looked like Jackson Hole, but still with no snow. And so we met in Denver and that was right after, I think it was like a week or two after Chris returned from the Copper Canyon for his first time. So mm. what one inspiration for me to get into mountain running and ultra running was the Tarmar Indians. And I, when I lived in Denver, that's all I heard about when they went to Leadville. So here was this mythological story of these great runners that I had kind of knew about. And now I'm meeting a guy who just came back from the Copper Canyon. And that's really kind of all we talked about. And we spent two days, uh, kind of hearing all his stories. And uh, eventually those two days ended up really kind of starting to craft the idea that maybe Chris could go down to the Copper Canyon and run 50 miles. Mm. Well, the, the story of that is beautifully outlaid in the first book, Born to Run. And now you have this one, which I have a copy of right here, Born to Run 2. So what's this all about? Hey, hey Fred, I got to ask you, the one you have, is it the actual book or is it a galley? Uh, does it have color pictures inside? No, it is. It is a sneak peek version. So okay. no, black and white for me. So I got I got an advanced copy. So, us too. We haven't seen the actual book yet, and I know that they're out there in the ecosystem. <laughs> but Eric and I haven't actually seen the physical, real book yet ourselves. So I thought maybe you had one. Like, hey, flip it open. Let's get a look inside. But. Um, <laughs> nope, nope, not that lucky. <laughs> yeah, uh, us either. So, you know, it's kind of funny. Eric and I talked about the fact that both of these books began with an act of sabotage, that we were supposed to be doing something else, and we just blew it up to follow this other this other ambition. So the first book, Born to Run, as Eric mentioned, I was supposed to be doing an article about Eric and his training in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. We did five minutes of meeting. We're like, ah. Hell with that. Let's talk about running. And maybe you could turn me into you know, an ultra runner and we could do this race. So the very assignment that I was getting paid to do, uh, we just completely kicked it down the road and focused on something else. And for this book, it was likewise. I was actually contracted to do a totally different book. And I spent two years working on it. And it was going to be called King of the Weekend Warriors. And the idea of the book was... It was going to be sort of a pushback against this alpha dog, alpha male mentality, which has crept into so many recreational sports, you know, where mm. people don't go for a run anymore. They're like fighting each other on Strava or yes, people who are in Peloton yes. or like racing each other. Everybody's racing, pushing, competing all the time instead of just like taking a breath, smelling the flowers, having a good time. And the sort of the archetype of that has been uh, David Goggins, who has a book out, which is really popular, you know, Can't Hurt Me. And it's about, basically, if you don't finish your workout in the emergency room, well, why weren't you trying? <laughs> and I thought, man, this, this, this is so, it's such a poisonous mentality. I think it is something that is so detrimental to exercise and, and life. You know, if we're constantly looking over our shoulder at who's catching up on us. So anyway, I, I was going to work in this book, King of the Weekend Warriors. And it was a pretty good narrative. I had, I had a lot of good points to make. But at, at one moment in the process, I had this kind of moment of clarity where I realized, you know, I'm not writing a book because there's something I want to say. I'm writing the book because I want to have an argument. And I am mm. embodying the very thing I'm telling people not to do. Don't compete against the other guy, but I'm going to write this book where I'm competing against the other guy. And it just struck mm. me just so, so poisonous and such a step backwards that I decided to hit the brakes and think, well, hang on, if I'm not having an argument, then what do I really want to do? What do I want to express? And I decided let's blow that book up and do the thing, which I think would really be helpful, which is to team up with Eric and share with other people 
the lessons he taught me 15 years ago that I, I can now come forward and say, look, look at me, you know, that apparently this stuff works. Yeah. Well, let's go into that a little bit, Eric. So a lot of your training advice, I, I'm going to have to say it's controversial. You know, it goes against what is some traditional standard training advice. So would you address that? Well, you, you might have to get a little bit more specific. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah, let's what start kind of, with... What's on let's the top start. of your mind? Um, <laughs> I don't. I, and I don't see it as controversial. So I, I don't... I don't, I don't yeah, go. Well, let's start with okay. shoes. shoes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, th so born to run, absolutely. You yeah. can credit that book for swinging the pendulum towards minimalist running shoes. Yeah. I ran my very first uh, marathon in minimalist running right. shoes <laughs> because of that book. And, but now of course the pendulum has swung the other way to super shoes, stack tights, you know, uh, all sorts of things like that. So you don't see elite marathoners running, you know, the Boston Marathon wearing sandals. So that's that's the first thing that I would like to talk about, the whole footwear thing. Yeah, so... Can, can I just jump for one second? Yeah, I yeah, yeah, go. I got to jump for one second. I, I love the fact that Eric is so convinced of his own wisdom that he doesn't even realize that everybody else thinks he's wrong. <laughs> I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm not at all. I'm just saying that it has gone both ways, for sure. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I, but no. The fact is that he's so, he, he's so confident and so deeply immersed in his own research that the fact that he doesn't even hear the other voices out there, which which I love. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know. So my my answer to that is that I, I want not only do I want more runners in this world, I want every runner experiencing what I call a natural running environment. We can, we can call them minimal shoes or barefoot. I think that's a bad idea because it, it pigeonholes in, into a category. That's a whole different story. But my whole thing is that I want everybody to experience natural running. And if we say that we have to, every, every runner has to give up their habit of cushion shoes, give up their habit of repping the brand. And, and so if, if we're telling runners that it's, one or the other every runner with their habit of of cushion shoes now and carbon fiber and super shoes they're going to rebel they're not going to do that so my whole mm -hmm. thing is that if we suggest that minimal running or what i call natural running can be a tool that is a superpower that completely changes the narrative and that mm -hmm. i guarantee you that Anybody who experiences natural running, they're going to see the benefits that we all want as runners. And so mm -hmm. if they see it as a tool, hey, they might then embrace the idea that it's not one or the other. But, hey, this is a tool that's going to benefit every runner out there. And so that 10 minute easy natural running run one day per week might end up being 20 minutes. It might end up being 40 minutes and now it's two minutes. And now the key is that they've experienced that superpower. They felt that superpower. And now they become to dabble and figure out. And, and it's, it's that feeling. And I guarantee once they feel that feeling, they're going to understand why it's so important. And then they can figure out how the balance it is for them and how they want to choose to use it for their running. Okay, good. I like this because it's not an all or nothing mentality like barefoot or super shoes is, you know, one or the other. You can use it as a tool. I like that a lot because I personally, I do both. I have minimalist shoes and I have the cushiest shoes on the planet and I use them for different reasons. So it's nice to hear that it's not my way or the highway. <laughs> yeah, and you brought up the, you know, the, the elites using super shoes and, and the cushion, you know, what, what we don't see is those some some of those elites running barefoot and training barefoot mm -hmm. and doing all the things that we're suggesting. But it's it's all about, hey, still all or nothing and what they're racing in. And there's still mm -hmm. a lot of those runners are experiencing that superpower. Yeah, absolutely. Because when you take off your shoes and you start to run, you are forced to run in a different way. If you crash on your heel barefoot, it's going to hurt. And you're going to stop, right? Correct. So what does running barefoot physically do for you? For me, it, it, it does everything we want. That's a good thing 
with within every run every runner would want it 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 not only what you said it it, it creates the usage of the feet and our usage of the feet for running and stabilization everything starts there so mm -hmm. how we use our feet how we use our arch how we use our big toe directly relate to how well we use all the muscles that we've been told are important for running all the way up through the hips and the whole body mm -hmm. You know, so it it just sets the course up for everything good. Yeah, and it's I think it's important to also tell people to start slow with this. Would you Would you agree, Chris? Well, you know, I think it's kind of weird that the conversation is sort of questioning and doubting like what bare feet are all about when it should be the other way around. You know, you start with bare feet. You are factory pre-installed with your feet. The question should be. Well, you know, what does running in a cushion shoe do for you? And should you start slowly with a cushion shoe? The cushion shoe is the external, unnatural thing that we're adding to the equation. But it, it is such kind of a, a refreshing commentary on our own life that we become so accustomed to these artificial things that it's almost like a travel to Mars to actually do without them. Uh, but you know, all along, you know, when people would sort of challenge bare feet, like, "Well, oh, we're not sure. Is it is it radical?" Like, dude, no, they are natural. The big cushion things are the things that are unnatural. So, but yeah, we are, if we are going to reacquaint our bodies with their own natural movement, uh, the fact that we have kept these things dormant. You know, if you were on bed rest for six months and then you you, you got back to your feet, you have to go slow. You know, you would have head spins and weakened muscles, and unfortunately, that's what happens mm -hmm. when you encase your feet in these immobilizing devices. To me, it's not even so much cushioning that's the problem. It's the fact that your toe box is restricted, that your arch is immobilized, that the entire foot has lack of range of motion. Uh, it's not even the cushion is underfoot. It's everything else that has been deactivated. You know, look, look at the arch, for instance. You know, your arch is a spring. It is designed to mm -hmm. compress and then bounce back up again. You put an arch support in there, and you have basically taken the arch offline. It's now inactive. And in almost every pair of shoes that you have, you have an arch support, which demobilizes that arch. And then now it has been asleep for years and years and years, and now you're asking it to then spring to action. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, I think I'm way more, more of a fire-breathing dragon than Eric is because Eric – comes at the question from a history of good practices. I come at it from a history of bad practices. I was a guy in middle right. age who was worn a cushion shoes, was always injured. So I was a guy that thought things were hopeless. And only after I realized by taking my shoes off that I could then do this, that's why I think I'm much more passionate about uh, advocating for minimalism, even than Eric is. Mm-hmm. So after we take our shoes off, <laughs> there are a few drills that you go over in the book, which I think um, people would get a lot out of if you could describe what they are. First of all, why do we do running drills and why do the particular ones that you advocate, how do they help us? Eric? Yeah. So first off, I, I call them skills because I see running as a skill. So instead of drills, I think people have a perception of in their mind of what drills are. So I, I call them skills because we see running as a skill that can be learned and and mm -hmm. and you can increase the ability to run better and better through these skills. So it all starts with the feet. You know, we call it foot core. We can train the feet. Like I mentioned earlier, everything we do, 100% of the thing we're doing as runners is using our feet 100% of the time. So we need that structural foundation. So we, we train the foot core. And then with the form and the minimal shoe environment and foot strike, we also have what I call leg stiffness. Having good leg stiffness is crucial for run health and longevity and performance. The stiffer our legs are, the better. So a lot of the skills that we're promoting in the book are actually jumping exercises to create better leg stiffness, which reduces our ground contact time, which keeps us healthy as runners. Mm -hmm. 
So another interesting point uh, in the book that you brought up was about running form. So, you know, it it used to be when we talked about running form, people would look at maybe one of the fastest elite runners and they would say, oh, this elite runner has the best form. Look at the way Iliad Kipchoge runs. It's absolutely perfect. That's really great form. But then the conversation kind of has shifted to saying, oh, everybody runs differently. Everybody has their own kind of form. The body will figure out what is the most efficient way to run. It doesn't really matter how you run because your body will decide for you. What do you what do you say about that? I just scream. I just scream into my pillow. It drives me (laughs) insane when I hear that because you hear this from people who then try to couch it in science, you know, that uh, different uh, scientific commentators or pundits in athletics will always say the same thing. Oh, yeah, your body, you know, follow your own natural game. Don't try to adjust it. I'm like, dude, would you say that about any other physical activity? Would you say, hey, if you're a diver, just jump off the board. Your body will figure it out before you hit the water, you know, or, hey, you think <laughs> it best, well, just chuck it in the air. You'll figure out how to make a shot. Of course not. Every Mm-hmm. actual physical biomechanical movement has a plus or a minus. You're either becoming more efficient or less efficient. And to tell somebody that we've now agreed has been inactive for a lot of their life, and now they're going to try to run, and you tell this person that your body's going to figure it out, that to me is a recipe for injury. And that is why people keep going to the running shoe store and saying, hey, give me something to fix my problem because my body is not figuring it out. And clearly the shoe's not going to help either. So we've put people on a path toward unhappiness and frustration, which unfortunately has become what running has become stigmatized with. Running is associated mm. with pain and injury and soreness and stiffness. You know, you hear it all the time. Well, if you run, you're going to hurt your knees. Yeah, not surprisingly, you're going to hurt your knees if you don't know what you're doing and you think the shoe's going to fix it. Mm -hmm. But the hard part is that the human brain cannot concentrate on something for very long. If you tell me that I'm supposed to think about holding my shoulders back and and driving my knee forward or whatever kind of form cue you want to throw at me, I can only do that for like 60 seconds. And then I'm thinking about what I'm going to make for dinner tonight, you know? So, (laughs) So how do you fix your form on the run or do you, Eric? Well, here's the problem is that so many of us focus on continuing to learn how to run in the book we propose that i can teach you to run in five minutes then it becomes that practice or that skill that takes place through time it's the must developing the muscle memory so i see it all the time is that when athletes are looking for the muscle memory that you described they get frustrated a little bit and they continue to try to learn more when it's the practice they need to put in place. And that's with the strength skills and all the exercises that we promote, that this is a lifelong practice that you should get better and better through time and and develop that practice and see it almost like a martial arts where this is the art of running and the art, the skill of running where you're getting better and better through time. I love it. So it's not always on the run. It's it's before the run, the skill practice, all of that, not necessarily thinking about how to run while you're running. Exactly. And and the the key is that you shouldn't necessarily have to think because the skills practice allows you to do it appropriately. And that's the point of a skill is that here, here is something that we're having you do that's creating an environment for you not to do it wrong. And then Mm. through that practice, you begin to feel better and better what of what good is. And that's where the practice really starts to take hold. And and let me say okay. that these strength skills and exercises can be done during your run. This is not something that has to take up more time out of your out of your day. You know, so okay, give me an example of that. Yeah, you some of them. The foot core is a great warm up. Now you're activating all your muscles throughout your body. You're turning muscles on for your run. You get into your run, you do your warm up, and then hey, maybe you jump into some some pogos and leg stiffeners, and it's something that you can do throughout your run that's continuing to create that muscle memory um, for run ho- run form to take hold longer and longer and longer. Hear her sports is a podcast for everyone who loves stories by and about women striving to improve and make a difference in their lives. 
I am your host, Elizabeth Emery, a former professional cyclist. In every episode, I introduce a female athlete or woman in the business of sport through a thoughtful conversation about who they are and the terrific work they're doing. My guests and I explore the glorious and frustrating issues in sports, history, equity, training, nutrition, and so much more. Join us for inspiration, for community, and for love of being a strong athletic woman. We'll get back to the conversation in just a minute, but first, did you know that I've written a book? Yep. The Planted Runner, Running Your Best with Plant-Based Nutrition will be officially out in January. If you're a fan of my work, this is the best way to get everything I teach about running and plant-based nutrition all in one place. It's not currently available for pre-orders on Amazon just yet, but you can reserve your copy now at theplantedrunner.com slash book. Pre-orders are incredibly helpful to gauge demand and let the robots who create those bestseller lists know which books to prioritize. Get yourself a little post-holiday treat at theplantedrunner.com slash book. So the next controversial thing that uh, you talk about in the book is has to do with fueling and carbohydrates and fats. So of course, we know that carbohydrates are what fuel fast running. Um, you know, I spoke about Iliab Kachogi, the fastest runner in the world in the marathon, and he is not eating steak, you know, as he is racing down the streets of Berlin. He is fueled by 90 grams of carbohydrate per hour or more. Um, but yet you guys talk about the importance of using fat for fuel. So I'd love to go into that. Yeah, I think, Claire, one of the things that is a centerpiece of Eric's approach, and I think his real genius for coaching, is teaching people how to really listen to their bodies. And you hear that phrase all the time, listen to your body. But the problem is we don't speak our body's language. You know, our body right. is still a pro in body. You know, we have the same hardware that we developed 2 million years ago. Our bodies have not physically evolved very much, but our, our minds have. So we're living in a technological world where we can push a little magic rectangle in our hand and someone will bring us food. We don't have to go out and look for it and dig it up and bring it home and prepare it. Push a button on your phone and food instantly appears at your door. So our brain is living in that world, but we have a body that is designed for movements and for detection of uh, danger and how to evade danger. So the problem was we had this disconnect, a body that's speaking one language and a brain is speaking a very, very different language. So you tell people, well, listen to your body, but you know what? Your, your body doesn't speak Urdu. Your body is speaking a different language entirely. And so what we're trying to get at the root of is to teach people that language again so when their body sends them a signal, they know what it's saying. And one primary area has to do with food and nutrition. You know, we're taking all kinds of calories in through our mouths at all times of the day or night, and we don't really know what the effect is. So when you feel sluggish in the afternoon, well, is it because you work too hard? Is it because you're stressed? Is it because you didn't sleep very well? Or is it because you ate a quarter pound of pasta 10 minutes ago? Like, what exactly is causing the effect that you're feeling? And so our goal in almost every single category of this book is let's strip away all the external unnatural forces Let's get back to your factory presets, and then that way, when you feel a certain way, you understand why. So, of course, it's, uh, it's obvious with shoes. Take away the cushion, the arch support for a second, understand how your foot is reacting to the ground, and then when you add more shoe, you'll understand the effect it's having. With food, it's the same way. We're not saying don't eat this, don't eat that. What we're saying is go back to your factory preset, experiment, and that when you eat a piece of bread, or you eat some roasted kale, or you eat a piece of bacon, you'll feel the effects and you'll realize, oh, I feel this way because that thing I ate 30 minutes ago. As far as using fat as fuel and sugars is concerned, you know, when you look at an elite marathoner, what they're doing is extraordinarily unnatural. To run for yes. two hours at less than 420 a mile is insane. That is sending a rocket ship to Mars based on nitroglycerin. You know, you're using yes. the most explosive caloric intake you possibly can to do something that no human in history has ever done or would ever do. 
the more natural human condition to actually is to run in a nice aerobic basis where you're not in a state of distress. So, yeah, he is drinking liquid nitroglycerin in order to send his rocket ship as quickly across the ground as possible. Most of us are, should, uh, are not and should not be in that kind of distress state. We should actually be relying on slow burn, low glycemic foods that allow our bodies to, to adjust naturally to digestion as opposed to constantly ramping up our insulin and ramping it back down again. Mm -hmm. Eric, do you have anything to add? I, I'll, I'll say, you know, I think we have to separate a little bit of performance and health. You know, what we don't know, we do know that, that Kipchoge is performing out of this world and, and marathoners mm -hmm. are performing out of this world. But what we won't really know is how healthy are they? And, you know, I, I've collaborated with universities and, and nutrition centers, and no one to this day has told me why we have essential amino acids and essential fatty acids, but no essential carbohydrates. No one, no one can answer that for me. So I, I, I understand it from a performance standpoint. Um, but like Chris said, I think we're all coming to it from really go a lot deeper that and see, see how it's making you feel, understand how you feel as a human being and as a healthy human being. Yeah, you know, I think that's an excellent point because I no one is running a marathon for their health. You don't need to do that to be healthy. So there is obviously something different going on than just health. We have different goals than just being healthy all the time. We we want to do something amazing, right? And so for some people that's the marathon, for some people that's 100 miles in the woods. Right. <laughs> you know, it's it's different for everybody, but of course, you know, we want health and longevity. But we also want that short term, you know, performance goal, too. Well, and, and I'll say, too, you know, based on 20 years of coaching and researching and all, all the stuff that I've done, I, I. I'm not convinced that. How we're talking, the elites are doing things is the proper way about going about it. I, I still think and this is a whole different, you know, I know well, this will go down a, a rabbit hole with this, but I don't think they need to rely on the carbohydrates on a daily basis like they do. I think they can strategically use it to perform when they need to from a performance standpoint. But I don't think it it's it's again, it's not that all or nothing approach um, that, yes. you know, if you look at the Hardu tribes and they're out fasting all day during their their hunt and they come across the beehive, they're going to stop and have honey, you know? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So, but it, it I, I think there, I think we're only on the tippy top of what's possible as far as nutrition and understanding it. Mm -hmm. Well, let's switch gears here. So something that I don't find controversial about your book <laughs> is, is fun. You guys bring up fun as being so important, and I think this is so underrated. We are busy adults with serious lives and serious goals all the time, and we forget to have fun. Chris, why is it so important? You know, I think that's actually the most controversial thing in the book. And uh, I was... <laughs> exactly. For real, right? Because Eric, Eric and I were talking about this, and I feel like, man, if we put in a chapter called fun... We have just sabotaged our book. People are not going to take it seriously. But, you know, I think that this is, you're exactly right, Claire. This is the sad, like, self-imposed punishment we've given ourselves that, hey, if you're smiling, then you're doing it wrong. Like, we feel like we need to apologize if we're having a good time. If you're on a run and you're not uncomfortable, you feel a little guilty. Like, I must not be working hard enough. And you know, the, the difficulty with that is, is to me, that's that's the downward spiral. That if you run and you finish and you're kind of sore, then you're going to be less inclined to want to go out the next day. So you take a day off and then you run again and it feels a little bit worse. You're, you're not actually ramping up, you're ramping down. And what we're telling people is that anything you do that sends a positive message radiating through your body, that is something that you're going to be more inclined to repeat. You're going to want to do it again. Your brain is hardwired to tell your body, that's a good thing for the species, keep it up. And on top of that, too, there is that sense that if it is enjoyable, that means you, you've stayed within your distress, uh, your distress mode. You've not gotten to the point where 
you're in calorie deficit, that you're in oxygen deficit, your machine is operating on a nice hum and it's sending signals that, okay, you're not putting yourself in a position of injury or risk. You're exactly where you ought to be. Mm -hmm. Eric, you want to well, add something? It, it just occurred to me that maybe this is the word that's the umbrella for the free seven is that if you have good a good nutritional diet, if you have good form, if you have good strength, if you have good footwear, if you have good community around you, that's going to create the joy and fun that we all seek to have in our own way. And I, I think yeah. that's the essence of the book. Yeah, I, I, I think it's hard, um, you know, because we, we run alone, we eat alone, we do our business alone. A lot of us are at home, you know, especially over the past two years, we've all been isolated from each other. It's, uh, it's hard to make friends in your 40s, <laughs> you know? Do you have any suggestions for the person who's listening to this who is probably on the run right now, who is probably alone right now, and has kids and a job and, you know, doesn't know where to start? I got two ones off the top of my head is to get out of your own head and think about somebody else. And the thing about it is, again, we're looking at those precious 45 minutes a day that we have for ourselves to go get a workout in. And we, we want to sort of you know, treasure those 45 seconds, uh, those 45 minutes. But what if everybody has someone in their lives that wants to begin running and is a little bit afraid? You know, they're not sure, they're not ready yet. And you've, we've all done it, right? You say, hey, you should come for a run with me. Well, I'm not ready yet. I got to do something else first. What if one day we, and, and Eric has done this with his Mike's uh, one block run. One day a week, every Wednesday, no matter what, you're going to find somebody and you're going to run with that person. They're slower than you are. They're not ready for it, whatever. And if they want to walk, you're going to walk. But dedicate that weekly run because that one day a week is going to become two and three really quickly. And then my friend Guillermo does something fantastic, which is he has sought out rescue shelters with rescue dogs. And it began as one day a week. Because he took in a rescue dog, and he was so happy with the joy this dog, this little chihuahua brought to his life, that he wanted to sort of pay it back, so he would go to other rescue shelters and volunteer to walk the dogs. And then he had the genius idea of, hey, I'm going to bring one of these rescue dogs to a running club every week and join their weekly run with the dog, and then everyone would fawn over the dog, and he had a 100% adoption rate. Every dog he brought to a running club would be adopted. And so that, that became his way of finding community and fun and it was so infectious that now he runs with rescue dogs five days a week. Eric, why don't you, why don't you describe Mike's one block run? Yeah, that I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to bring that up. Um, and I'm actually looking to rekindle it. We've we found another friend who has cancer. Um, just learned that today. So um, the the idea behind Mike's block run was I had, I had a good high school friend who was just kind of lost his fitness and just kind of lost his way as far as you know, kind of that day to day feel good about yourself type of thing. And I just recommended, hey, let's let's instead of everybody looking towards the weekend to maybe, you know, they, they just kind of get through the week. And, you know, we call Wednesday hump day because it's it's halfway to what we look forward to. I wanted people to look forward to hump day and every day. Mm. And so we started Mike's block run. His name was Mike, obviously. And all I told him was, hey, just get up, run around the block and be done and just watch what happens. And we eventually got a group of people to do the same things. So we had Mike's block run every Wednesday night. Everybody just ran around their block and it just kind of, it was just authentic. It, Mike started blogging about it and eventually it led to him to run in 50 miles. And wow. not that we have to go run 50 miles, but it, it just, it, it just kind of created that, superpower that super pill the magic pill that running can provide that um I, I feel is is so powerful i love that i love that you just kind of take the pressure off a run because if you tell somebody who's not a runner hey let's go for a run they're like Ugh. first of all running sucks and second of all i can't do that running's painful but when you just say hey let's jog around the block that's that's anybody's going to say yes to that, right? And and I think too, you know, getting back to the beginner runner is sometimes if we strip away that it has to be a workout or it has to be for fitness or for to lose weight, but that it's just an activity to go around the block that completely breaks down all the barriers and it focuses on just doing it. No one would balk at walking around the block, but what about running around the block? 
And maybe that runner, hey, try to make it as easy as possible and not, it doesn't have to be hard. It shouldn't be hard. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Uh, so what does it mean to run free? What is, what does that phrase mean? Let's see. I, let me start because this was a revelation to me when, and this, this is a phrase that really we trace back to our friend, Micah True, Caballo Blanco, the white horse. Cause he, he, that was his motto, run free, run free. And uh, he, he thought of himself as being this kind of untamed Mustang or racing across the, the desert, you know, no one can put a, no one can put a saddle on Caballo. And that's kind of the way he lived his life, rambling around on his own. And he never had workouts or trained for things. He just got up in the morning, sniffed the air, decided which direction looked best, and off he went. And if it was going to be a five-mile run, maybe it became a 30-mile run because he had that kind of a range. And so when I first met him, I was intoxicated by this notion like, wow, I mean, and the thing about it was he was like my exact height, shoe size, and my same age when he first went down to the Copper Canyon. So when I met him, he had already lived for 15 years the life I wanted for myself. I wanted to be able to walk out the door and just go in any direction at any time as far as I felt like at any given moment. And to, to meet a guy who was living that dream that seemed impossible to me was really this tantalizing fantasy. And what it really meant was this ability of being able to restore your own natural elasticity and, and natural sources of energy so that running is just something that is, is as available to you as the car keys are on the kitchen counter. At any point, you pick the car keys and go, same thing with your body. And he had this phrase, which became really the mantra that has stayed with us throughout Born to Run, Born to Run 2. And step one is first focus on easy, because if that's all you get, that ain't so bad. That's right. Eric, what does it mean for you? Yeah, I, for me, it's, you know, kind of reflecting on that word free of maybe that if, if we embrace some core principles or core skills or um, a way of life with our running that we can run injury free, we can run, you know, void of limitations for ourselves. And kind of for me, I, I get a little bit more kind of emotional about that, that type of thing, but just kind of going for it and, and not worrying about what might happen and just being free from what could happen and just living, living, you know, running free. Great. Great. So what do you hope that uh, readers will get from born to run to Chris? Yeah, for me, I just feel that I've been sitting on this magic formula for a long time. Uh, Eric shared it with me back in 2004, 2005 when we met. And I feel like I'm in the position, I was in the position then that many runners remain in to this day, where they're struggling with injury, with self-doubt. Uh, they're looking, they're looking, they want to enjoy it, and they don't. They look at running as this thing they got to do, this punishment that they got to go through to make up for something else that they've done wrong. And Eric taught me a long time ago, you can reverse that. Running can be as joyful for you as it is for any four-year-old. You know, no, no four-year-old is like, you know, pulling their leg behind their back to stretch or feeling like, well, I better do some yoga this weekend if I'm going to play on the, in the playground next week. They just go for it. They're out the door, right. bam, full speed all the time. So Eric told me, hey, that's possible. I didn't believe it. And I deliberately did not put any of that training information in the original Born to Run because to me it was all brand new. I ain't sure this stuff works. The only barefoot runner I know is Barefoot Ted, and I am not putting my hand on a Bible for that guy. So <laughs> I kept it to myself, but now I've seen 15 years later, wow, this really works. And so what we really wanted to do was tell people, you can dial into all of these free sources of pleasure, and they're not going to detract from your running. They're going to amplify it, and no matter who you are. You know, you could be someone with 100 marathons under your belt, but I guarantee you, you've got a wobble or a little niggle somewhere in your system that you've been struggling with. Or you can be someone who's been running for 15 years, but you're still running as an, uh, as an antidote for your diet. There are lots of people who still have a problem with their running. We, we think that we can really uh, offer a lot of help to. Great, great. Eric, so when does the book come out? Do you have a date? December 6th is the big day, yeah. It's 
Yeah, so how more exciting. Weeks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, where can listeners connect with you? Obviously, they can buy the book or wherever books are sold. How can they reach out if they have questions or want to connect? Yeah. So we've got our website, which is borntorun.world. And same tag for all the social media outlets. Our YouTube channel is Born to Run World. Um, that has a lot of supporting video for the book. And then we both have our individual sites. I have a community site that um, has a lot of Q&A type of interaction um, running with Eric. Chris is chrismcdougal.com. You know, so it, it's pretty easy to find us. And we, we'll, we have a lot of supporting information out there and we'll continue to have a lot of supporting information. We, we would uh, really like people to reach out and ask you with their questions yeah. because Eric will record live interviews with people and actually answer their questions in real time and post it online. So we, we want those questions. Yep. Oh, cool. Yep. That's awesome. Well, this has been great. I think this perfect place to wrap it up. I really enjoyed meeting you both. Chris, you're an absolute legend in the running world. And it is uh, just delightful when I saw your name come across my email. And yes, I'll interview him. Of course I will. <laughs> Immediately. When can I talk to him? So, uh, <laughs> so I don't think I was too hard on you, but <laughs> you guys were great. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you. That was really, really fun, Claire. Thanks. That was really a dream of mine to be able to talk with Chris McDougall and meet his coach, Eric. Like so many others, Born to Run inspired me right at the beginning of my running journey. I ran my first marathon in minimalist shoes. And while I would not recommend that if you're looking to run your fastest race, I do still wear minimalist shoes at times in my training, especially during strength training. If you are interested in learning how to run free, Born to Run 2 is available everywhere books are sold. And now it's time for the Mental Strength Minute. Fortify your mind in 60 seconds or less. Today's topic is thumb tapping. When a run gets really hard and you find your mind starting to go negative, start tapping your thumb against your forefinger. You can either do this in a rhythmic pattern or you can apply some hard pressure, even using your nail. The goal is not pain, but distraction. When you change focus from the voice in your head to creating a pattern or even a little pain, your mind has something else to do and something else to feel. Of course, don't dig so hard that you draw blood, but thumb tapping can be an unusually effective way of shifting the negativity somewhere else. Once you notice that your mind is clear, the rough patch in your run will be behind you. Thank you so much for listening to the Planted Runner podcast or watching it on YouTube. The ability for me to make this show absolutely depends on the amount of listens, downloads, reviews on Apple Podcasts, and ratings on Spotify. So if you've already reviewed, thank you. If not, please take a moment after your run today to give it five stars. Have a great run today. Women's Running Stories, where we explore the intersection between running and life. Because every woman who is committed to a running journey has a story to tell, and this is where you'll find those stories. I am host and producer Cherie Louise Turner. I'm a 53-year-old runner, and together with original music by musician and runner Cormac O'Regan, we bring these inspirational stories to life. Please join us to fuel your adventures.